Hello all, and now I figured that we will conclude with Heidegger by looking at some of his essays, particularly after World War II, where there's the backdrop of uh, the modern world now being defined by the conclusion to um, really global capital and uh, markets being at the forefront as compared to um, the reaction to it. But uh, before we begin looking at uh, the thing and uh, the question regarding technology, I uh, wanted to part by uh, talking a little bit about how Heidegger's works themselves are presented, where you have being in time in 1927, I believe, and uh, it's his only long-standing uh, real book, and it, not only that, it was unfinished. Um, there was supposed to be a, a, another part after uh, his discussion of uh, time being is sort of the start of the book, and then you go towards uh, time. Uh, there was supposed to be a, a further volume there. But what I find interesting, and, and particularly postmodern about it, is how um, Heidegger's essays, uh, much, which are much shorter, um, although they are, in a way, you know, much like books, and you know, the, today they're published as, as if they uh, were, really. Um, there is something postmodern and something that reminds me of A Thousand Plateaus with Deleuze and Guattari, where you, know, you can start that book technically from any chapter. There's no real um, you know, modern scheme of beginning, middle, and end. And I think that's the same with Heidegger here, where you know you have to pick at each of these essays separately, but they're all in a way sort of this one cohesive book, um, even though there is just parts of it, and you can take those parts, and uh, despite them concluding, um, you take some of those parts and then you use them to understand some of his other essays, and. Uh, of course, that makes them notoriously hard to understand, and I can see why, and I'm thankful for these Heidegger videos being some of my most popular on YouTube by far. Uh, I think that is a testament to how you know, difficult Heidegger can be, but it's uh, very rewarding, I think. So, um, uh, putting that aside, um, and, and looking at how there's no real you know, order to them, but nonetheless, they sort of fit together uh, if you want to understand them. I wanted to look at the question regarding technology, which usually requires understanding uh, truth events and aletheia. Um, so Heidegger starts really with asking, um, which by the way, you can see that in my prior lectures on uh, uh, truth. I don't want to, um, I've noticed on these lectures, I tend to uh, overlap um, a lot of uh, the connotation within it, and I don't want to repeat myself too much, but uh, that is uh, uh, sort of uh, goes with how Heidegger presented the works themselves. There's definitely, um, you know, once you get the connotation down, you kind of see uh, where he's going repeatedly. And so with the question regarding technology, though, he wants to ask, you know, what is the essence of technology? And so he points to us with the terminology called inframing. And inframing, or at least his concern with it, is how nature uh, is presented to us through inframing, where it's stored up for a later date to be uh, you know, somewhat on hand, to use some of his other terminology there. Um, and so he indicts the likes of uh, Descartes and Newton uh, in the rise of, of modern science uh, where you know they were looking at the perception of objects through these uh, you know primary qualities, if you will, uh, through uh, you know analytics such as geometry or gravity and force as ways to code the world with uh, the scientific and framing. And so, of course, for Heidegger, this is a uh, this is the problem of deworlding. Um, so for Hardenheit, which is the theoretical world for him, um, is his reaction to Husserl, his mentor, of thinking uh, that that is like the main 
uh, mode of, of, of being where, uh, you know, having these abstract uh, uh, concepts is, you know, what makes us uh, beings in this pure perception or that purely uh, theoretical basis. And so Heidegger is worried that for Handenheit is where, you know, people themselves will become abstract or anonymous entities or the they, the das Mann, um, is to reduce us to these quantities as opposed to, you know, having the myth belt or story or that sort of regional um, connotation towards things in the world or our own being and how uh, that will be understood or represented for us. Instead, it's this scientific face space. Um, and so um, openings are these certain facets of the world that comes out in the truth event that reveal about the world that was once not there. But of course, with technology and science, this obscures away or uh, conceals it uh, since we are not able to tap into um, authenticity. Um, and so he uses the term coming into being as a poesis, which is the mode of, um, you know, technological and artistic things in uh, classic Greek culture, where, you know, the artist uh, in the creation of worlds uh, had the, the, the care and the concern into cultivating things. Um, the maker creates these worlds uh, to make us, you know, understand our own being or uh, our throneness, as he would call it. And then if we were looked at Phusis, which is nature itself bringing into being by itself in that self-sufficient uh, manner, um, much like a, you know, a plant, you don't, there's no understanding for uh, the plant in some abstract face space. Um, it simply comes out. Um, there's the given, uh, the birth is spontaneous, making itself from out of itself within nature that a uh, Fusus represents. Um, and so, you know, Heidegger is trying to really get at that you can't have a sort of causal principle for, um, you know, being revealing itself to us has that sort of truth process itself of revealing, but ultimately as he would warn, we're not the masters of being, of course. Uh, we don't have a sort of causal way to force, uh, you know, being or the turning as it will get into. Um, but then he focuses more on uh, nature and how it's challenged. And uh, challenging is an important word to consider here uh, because we're putting forth to nature as energies being stored and released upon and breaking and extracting for standing reserve, which is another term. Uh, this is how the landscape or our world as by and large is to use us as um, uh, demand or for use, um, uh, standing reserve as he'd call. And so science and technology you know, uh, has this sort of gaze upon the landscape as a sum potential of forms of energy uh, we see uh, with uh, his example of the Rhine River becoming just a standing reserve for uh, the hydro uh, um, method within uh, the dam. Um, the hydro dam turns the Rhine into standing reserve of energy as opposed to you know, the uh, Germanic poems and hymns and, and, and songs uh, that he believes is a more authentic uh, way prior of understanding the world. So modern understanding or sciences and framing of quantities for extraction and storage of energy supply through the challenging of, of nature. And so in framing, he suspects, puts people such as the example of uh, the terminology of human resources as a culturally destructive force uh, to people becoming these sort of quantities themselves where uh, we slide into the landscape in the, uh, you know, the metropolitan or the, the global uh, city 
that he's looking at after World War II, where um, you know everyone is is um, sort of in this concealed uh, way uh, uh, in the landscape, and um, there's you kind of see this, of course, with you know if you've ever been to places outside of the urban sprawl, certainly in America. Um, you know, the, uh, it, it's very, of course, this is very somewhat, uh, Heidegger would probably consider maybe a cliche in a way, but I always think of, uh, you know, the Southern hospitality or, um, you know, opening the door for the next person to come through. You don't see that in uh, the megapolitan uh, because, quite frankly, it can be very dangerous to uh, you know, uh, reveal yourself in that sort of way or, um, expose yourself uh, to these uh, quantities around you who have their own uh, goals and objectives that uh, do not uh, stand with your own representation or understanding. And so there's an interesting dichotomy, of course, with artist and the technology, um, which is a split from the Greek understanding of techni and artistry. Uh, we talked earlier about um, you know, care and um, the cultivating of, of things in Greek culture, um, where there, there's a sort of synthesis between the two. But in the modern world, this is split apart and is even uh, at wit's end with each other. And so there's a dialectic, if you will, of, of, of artistry, of using those earthly uh, elements, as I talked about with that, my video on idea, uh, or Michael Larson. Uh, as compared to someone like Nietzsche would say with the Socratic man or science where, you know, we're, you know, building down into these primary qualities that are agreed upon in the geometric phase space. Of course, that was you know, before him, but um, this is the modern understanding or the modern conundrum. So the artist, of course, discovers and reveals worlds to us from those earthly aspects in a fourfold manner that we'll get into in a little bit uh, in one of his other essays, um, as in framing the world's us and is uh, culturally, um, you know, taking away our distinctiveness uh, and taking away the revealing of uh, capital being. And so Heidegger, of course, is always interested in the essence or essential of what building thinking or dwelling as his work on is to take care of your landscape and to care with it and be concerned over your dwelling over your landscapes uh, that make up your world and so the bridge is sort of a manifold of the construction of dwelling as a whole in an authentic space in which places uh, in that sort of world building capacity humans build to dwell as opposed to the uh, scientific uh, way. He's trying to describe how a more authentic way of uh, cultural creation happens as opposed to in framing. And so uh, one of the uh, startling aspects for him with technology is the distance uh, or nearness being eroded away with uh, the elements of the far. And so technology as he was describing with the rise of uh, television and, and the turning away from radio of course now we have uh, hyper-connected uh, um, satellites and um, luminous squares that um, you know bring us together constantly and totally erase the nearness uh, uh, um, as opposed to the far and so near is, is more of an authenticity uh, that levels off every place to make it, um, you know, inauthentic or nihilism as compared to uh, a place or a creation that's cultivated uh, that helps uh, understand uh, who we are. And so making near into the far, if everything is equally accessed, there is no place or um, any meaningful relationship to our landscapes or our dwellings uh, towards Dasein. And so for his more concrete example that he offers up is uh, the jug. And so the jug has the aspects of the earth through the water, which is comes from the sky. 
and um, it's been set forth and has contact with the nearness uh, that the object is put into, whereas you know science or in framing objectifies the jug as simply its you know, qualities of you know what's inside of it. Is it water? Is it wine? It's just a hollow volume. Is it 16 uh, ounces or 20 or um, uh, there's no story or myth or relationship uh, with the jug. And of course, this is just an example of uh, you know, the greater schema he's trying to describe uh, with how science uh, culturally levels off all of these uh, aspects to us. Uh, science objectifies down without the myth or authenticity as opposed to just an object with primary qualities. And then, of course, he uh, then, in the turning, uh, if we're going to move from thinking and, and dwelling, uh, the turning, then, is language and the arts remind us of being in discourse. Language is the house of being. Uh, Whereas in framing is much like a filter onto the world, uh, which turns us away from uh, discourse on being. Technology wipes away the discourse of being through the inframing age of devastation, where uh, being has abandoned beings. Um, non authentic things in its presence that gathers are now stripped of his fourfold of what is an authentic thing that things. Um, yeah, some of this Heidegger uh, terminology, but as you can see, there he is having a concise point here. Uh, like I said, it's very hard to describe um, this in, in this sort of language capacity. Of course, he has to use metaphor instead of the classic logic that philosophy was prior to him. And you see that, of course, with Nietzsche, and, and it's definitely true with uh, postmodern thought to come where you know, metaphor and uh, the limitation of language and uh, the introduce, introduction of uh, hermeneutic interpretation as well uh, is something to keep your eye on as well when going through these essays. Um, and so his fourfold of earth, sky, divinities, and man, uh, where we describe with the jug, uh, the sort of, uh, you know, the earth um, with... Um, the water um, and, and, and the sky which which it comes down from the divinities of you know there uh, certainly is the ritualization prior to um, you know the wine or the water uh, uh, nutrients within uh, the jug that sustains man uh, has a sort of ritual to it uh, and an understanding of it um, and so for Heidegger, only when man is the shepherd of being, uh, it's not a, a matter of being a master of it, but uh, being the shepherd, uh, being the, uh, the guide, um, where danger grows uh, out of inframing is where the solution is actually going to come. This is him saying that you know, through uh, this philosophical thinking and, and contemplation of our dwellings, um, or lack of, um, is also going to be the ingredients of uh, saving ourselves, saving being, and having the turn away from this epoch. Uh, there's a, you know, a, a dialectical approach here where um, perhaps the synthesis, the solution, if you will, is of course found uh, within uh, the prior propositions of inframing. So the epoch of inframing will come to an end by becoming more authentic and not hijacking nature, uh, using care and cultivation, of course, and not uh, placing the world in a standing reserve. Uh, there's a sort of element, of course, and uh, this is particularly unpopular, perhaps, with um, contemporary Heideggerians, where you know there's no causal way of, of, of having um, uh, the, the turning, if you will, um, we, we tend to just uh, have these solutions or, or the artist tends to come forth or uh, the flash of the revealing, as he describes, 
there's no causal mechanism uh, to it. It's just from the elements that uh, we are given to us or thrown into. Uh, but we don't really understand where those, uh, how it actually uh, works as a process. And I think that's uh, interesting because, um, you know, Heidegger, of course, uh, at the turn of the century, um, or mid-century even here, uh, I think this is 40s and 50s now, um, certainly just, uh, you know, chalking it up to the ground of being or, or, or God uh, is, is pretty vogue now. But uh, I think you can still find within his uh, writings that there definitely is a, a higher force, a higher calling that's beyond just, um, you know, human mechanisms of, of process or uh, cause and effect or something like that. Uh, there's a sort of hidden messiah element here that a new god is going to put forth uh, the end of this epoch of inframing. And so in an authentic world, man uh, you know, keeps safe uh, through care of dwelling. And this is uh, the opposite of where you lived in an impoverished, uh, improvised oblivion uh, and um, less towards uh, safety. Uh, presence of the thing, uh, authentic mode, which is not hijacked in its face based by uh, science, the thing that is near that gathers the gods, such as the jug, the liquid of the earth, gathers mortals for the liquid from the sky to ritualize those divinities, just to offer a brief summation uh, from that earlier uh, example of his fourfold. And so when we looked at other civilizations, and certainly... Uh, when Spangler does with, you know, the concept of a pseudomorphosis, where a civilization is trying to express itself in a different way, uh, but is, you know, embracing its own throneness. Um, I think a good example that uh, John David Ebert actually talked about uh, in his lectures on, uh, uh, on these works is um, in the Magian civilization and its architecture. Um, where there's a sort of halfway point of them trying to figure out, uh, you know, the first mosques uh, and, and the, uh, the world as a sort of cavern as compared to uh, the Greeks and, and the Roman uh, art uh, of, of the body, um, where um, you see the, the start of the soul and the psyche of, of Numina. Um, and so through architecture, Spangler uh, shows that there's a new world as, as cave as opposed to the classical precursor. Um, this is, you know, how Islam and, and um, it's coming, it came out of uh, Hellenism uh, through that uh, pseudomorphosis of, you know, taking those elements out of, and, and, and finding uh, through a, truth events in, in history as Heidegger would describe um, um, although, uh, it, it, in a sort of turning way, um, you know, it, there's a process to this that it doesn't just, um, happen overnight. Um, and so being pointed at objects that is manifest in an intelligible way from those historical conditions to some, uh, summarize there. And so when he describes, of course, the metaphor of the clearing in the forest to where unconcealment happens, where there's a world space uh, uh, that opens up and, and, and shines uh, of, of being into, the, into looking. Um, whereas, you know, art today is a sort of worldless object. Uh, there's no meaning to any, uh, there's no set of ideas that the artist in contemporary times, it's usually just for monetization, a few clicks on a TikTok going viral and, um, there's this, which is to say that this is just, uh, you know, an inauthentic time as a whole, a time of nihilism. There's no set of ideas or understanding. Everyone has, um, you know, their own sort of kitsch interpretation of things. Um, and so some of the other terms that I think are interesting to keep in mind when you look through Heidegger's work, especially with the turning, is disclosure, which is the rupture of singularity that is filled with meaning or significance to go back to that sort of truth event of history uh, and um, 
ultimately his um, his calling of uh, a new epoch of the turning uh, out of, which will uh, be provided through us through um, these elements of enframing we can't just you know strip um, and framing away uh, and you know just get rid of technology uh, as a whole um, this is to ignore its actual like essence and so uh, the flash of being although um, we ourselves are not the causal reason for when that will happen we simply wait for the opportunity or the clearing uh, to come about uh, usually through an actual authentic artist. And there's something very interesting to part here and finish up with how, you know, when Spangler talks about um, you know, a, a great uh, uh, man of history such as Goethe, um, you know, Goethe in a way was buoyed up by, you know, these great cultured men around him and how, you know, in the springtime uh, of a culture, um, you know, just the greatness of, of each other sort of feeds off of, uh, off of it. And you kind of see this, of course, uh, with, you know, what would be considered, of course, as bread and circus. But, uh, you know, in team sports, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, you have a team that's uh, gathered together that sort of, you know, has a sort of momentum. Uh, not everyone has to be as great as Goethe. Um, uh, they they sort of help each other out, um, which it of course um, you know doesn't have a sort of causal mechanism to it. It's just something that happens, and I think there's something to be said here about um, you know being in the in the winter stage here, where uh, yes, we do have some of these elements of of the artists that can bring about you know the turning away from and framing, uh, but they're stymied, they're held back. Uh, they're a part of the bread and circus. They're in the megapolitan, concerned about money and um, um, these inauthentic things that seem to get in the way of, of, of being or its description of it and its dialogue. Um, that's something to consider uh, when we look at our own time and uh, you know the waiting of a, of a new god or a new being uh, to come about that uh, will end in framing. And so, yeah, this is probably, uh, yeah, I'm willing to say that this will be my final lecture on Heidegger before I then move on to uh, Jean Paul Sartre uh, and uh, the uh, postmodern uh, influence that Heidegger is going to have on the likes of Gadamer um, and uh, his d direct uh, uh, pupils. Uh, as we'll see, Gadamer was a student of his, um, so it'll be interesting to look at how Heidegger, um, especially with uh, his concept of, of truth, uh, is going to influence the rest of the 20th century um, in our contemporary lives today. So yeah, this was my uh, Heidegger lecture series. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, make sure to comment and subscribe. Uh, find me on BitChute bongo poster and find me on twitter at uh, bongo bongerson so i hope you guys enjoy and i'll see you for the next one